Northern Ireland revelations, including how taxpayers' money ended up in Mauritius. Tune in from five past nine on BBC Radio Ulster. Following the arrival of Syrian refugees to a small Irish town and the problems both they and local people have encountered in the Hotel for Refugees. In half an hour here in BBC One Northern Ireland, after this week's Spotlight. Welfare reform has arrived here. It's time to say goodbye to disability living allowance and hello to PIP, the new personal independence payment. Good afternoon, you through to the Independent Welfare Changes Helpline. More than 100,000 people are being reassessed as they move across to the new benefit. Many are losing out. We're seeing clients who had DLA for life um, being reduced down to nothing. The title is Personal Independence Payment and by taking away my car, they were taking away the, the, my, my ability to have a little bit of independence. But those behind the changes say the new benefit is working. It is light years better than the old benefits. We are getting more money to the right people, and that is a good thing. Capita is the private company managing the switchover. But how transparent are their assessments? And what if some are wrong? I thought, no, this must be some kind of a mistake. There were a lot of inaccuracies. Tonight, Spotlight can reveal growing concerns that on occasions Capita have been changing, or as they call it, auditing their assessments before submitting them to those deciding whether claimants should get their benefits or not. What they say is that either their words were twisted or that some of the things in the assessment were just fabricated. Thousands of people are now challenging their decisions. But who is challenging Capita? Certainly Capita should be called before the committee for scrutiny in terms of the assessments that they provide. This is Martin Murta. He's 66 and lives in sheltered housing in North Belfast. His family have been devastated by dementia. Two of his sisters have already died due to the illness. A third is in a nursing home. It was so sad and I usually break down when I talk about it. I don't know how I haven't broke down. I can still see them. I can still see them as if they're sitting there. I don't want to forget them. In Martin's home, labels have been put up to help him to remember to do things, because now Martin has been diagnosed with dementia as well. Martin's sons take it in turn to look after him, but after seeing the rapid decline of their three aunts, they are worried about what lies ahead. Me and my three brothers, we all try and come down, try and would take turns staying or cooking or no helping my father out. I mean, it's all you can do, really, isn't it? Be there for your family in their time of need. I know it's going to get worse, but there's nothing to do about it. Under the old system, Martin was on lifetime DLA. He has now been reassessed under the new system, PIP. Personal independence payment is much harder to get than DLA because it places less importance on your diagnosis. Instead, what counts is how well you can function on a day-to-day -day basis. Martin comes along to this dementia support group once a week. And I'm Lil, and uh, I have dementia. I'm Martin, I have dementia. Through submitting a Freedom of Information request, Spotlight has discovered that more than 125,000 people across Northern Ireland will have to be reassessed to see if they are still eligible for benefits. Campaigners think those with dementia shouldn't have to go through the process of being reassessed, but almost all of them will. There's nobody around this table here sitting through trying to fill the system. We have dementia. Dementia at some stage is going to kill us. Most of this group are due to have their benefits reassessed, but because they look physically healthy, some are now frightened to leave the house. Some of our members are now feeling that they're too scared to go out over the door yes, yes. because somebody might shop them in um, for just going out and living their lives. And it's, it's an extra stress and it's an extra worry um, to burden our members with highlight sort of what it was like to go through. Just move this for you. Martin is starting to go through the reassessment process. 
His family has found the paperwork very difficult. Some of the questions on it, about the toilet, about the shower, about the dress and about the cooking. Well, they must know if you've got dementia or any sort of illness that you're diagnosed with, that you can't do these things. As part of the process, an assessor came to his home. He asked me, could you touch your toes? He says, what about the toilet? Martin answered that he takes me out of the toilet, he shares me, they do the bath and the they do the cooking. You being able to touch your nose or put your hands in your head or t whatever, touch your toes, I mean, how is that relevant to having dementia? Martin relied on the money from his DLA for essentials. The money helps and you're able to do, I'm able to get a taxi, go to the shops, I'm able to get clothes, I change a lot. Where me were in pods, I soil a lot and I need a lot of bed clothes, I need a lot of clothes. I throw the stuff out. With, with that money, I'm able to get the things, I'm able to get the help I need. Hi, Simon. How are you doing, Peter? Hi, nice to see, to see you again. Yeah. How are you keeping? Uh, Simon Matchett used to live life to the full, but that changed when he felt something was wrong. It started just with tingling, like um, pins and needles, and then it sort of made its way up my arm when the doctor wasn't too sure what it was. Simon was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. He was 32. It was a shock to the system. It was um, the lesions that you get have on your brain and spinal cord, they move around so they can attack any sort of set of nervous system in the body. Um, so you don't know when or where or how bad the attack could be. He had been holding down a full-time management job in Edinburgh, but as the condition began to deteriorate, he moved back home to a bungalow in Bangor to be near his family. Simon was getting higher rate DLA and was able to get a mobility car to help him get around. He was worried about Pip as he had heard stories from those with MS in England who had lost their entire award. I was extremely stressed and that is not a good um, sort of state to be in with MS, with it being a condition that affects your nerves. Your letter will tell you more about a new benefit called Personal Independence Payment or PIP. As we know, PIP isn't paid just because someone has an illness. What matters is how it affects their ability to do specific things. If you choose to make a claim... DLA was a, an assessment of your total circumstances, the difficulties that you have. But particularly, and there was a good deal more leeway in saying, well, I've got difficulty with this, I've got difficulty with that. PIP is different because it has 12 activities. You're scored on what you can do with regard to those activities. Do you have difficulty eating? Uh, can you manage the toilet? Can you dress? So you have a number of limited activities. They look at your capacity to do these. Supporters of the new PIP system say the cost of DLA was spiralling. More than 200,000 people in Northern Ireland claimed it, costing taxpayers more than £1 billion a year. It was the Conservative government that introduced PIP. Justin Tomlinson is a former Minister for Disabled People and had responsibility for PIP. To be absolutely clear, the stakeholders and the charities do recognise that PIP is a better benefit than DLA. Through the introduction of personal independence payments, we are uh, getting more people accessing the higher rate of benefits. It is a much, much better benefit. It was never about cutting the money. It was about recognising there is a much wider spectrum of challenges that people face through their own individual long-term health conditions or disabilities. PIP was introduced in Northern Ireland in 2016, and so far over 55,000 have applied for it. Getting PIP is quite a complicated process. Firstly, you'll receive a letter telling you that you're going to be reassessed. You'll be posted a copy of this form, which is called PIP2. It's 40 pages long and asks you about how your disability affects your life. Then most people will have a face-to-face -face assessment, either at a centre like this or at their home, where the PIP assessor will interview them. If you're not happy with your decision, you can ask for what is known as a mandatory reconsideration. This is where you write a letter to the Department for Communities asking them to look again at your case and you can provide further medical evidence. Finally, if you still aren't happy, you can bring your case here for appeal where you'll face a panel of legal and disability experts.
Jill Frey Pollen suffers from muscular dystrophy, an acute form of it. She's the only person with this particular type in Northern Ireland. She and her husband David settled here after he began working as a test pilot for shorts in the late 90s. They volunteer at a Newtonard's food bank, itself on the front line of dealing with the fallout of Pip. We've seen an increase in people coming along to the food bank specifically because they've been, maybe been on a high rate and it's been reduced to the low rate, so then they're kind of trying to manage on that or it's literally been cut altogether. So people are really having to come to the food bank because their DLA has stopped. Yes, definitely. Jill has also had her disability reassessed for PIP. My legs are almost useless. This type of muscular dystrophy impacts on just about every body system. I'm just a, a, a carer for her. And uh, so I can't really go anywhere alone without the thought, is she all right? I have come back um, from being out and found her on the floor. Jill had been on higher rate DLA. She qualified for a mobility car which was able to hold her electric wheelchair. Capita, who won the £65 million contract to deliver Pip in Northern Ireland, sent an assessor out to see Jill. She assumed she had transferred straight over to Pip because of her condition. My reaction was, she'll come in, she'll check me out, um, and she'll see that I obviously can't do a lot of things for myself. And um, I really didn't think there would be any difficulties at all. But then a letter from the Department for Communities brought a nasty surprise. I was, I was pretty optimistic that it would be OK. But I prayed over it anyway. And I opened it up. And I could not believe what it said. I was absolutely in shock. And I thought, no, this must be some kind of a mistake. They're not talking about me. And I realized, yes, they were talking about me. And things that were written in the letter, there were a lot of inaccuracies. The assessor decided Jill was able to walk a greater distance than she says she can. She was given eight points, which means she did not get enough to keep her mobility car, which she will have to return before Christmas. The report also said she managed to get up off a chair unaided, but the couple say that didn't happen. There was nobody more surprised uh, than us when the re first rejection letter came back, saying we have um, awarded you the lower rate of PIP, but the higher rate is denied because we don't think you have any, mo uh, any mobility issues. At a mandatory reconsideration, Jill's request for a car was again turned down. Like many others in the same situation, she is now waiting for a date for her appeal. Spotlight has obtained figures which show that more than 12,000 people here have asked for a mandatory reconsideration. But you shouldn't hold out much hope if you think your decision will be overturned. Spotlight has obtained a document which shows that only around 20% of decisions at mandatory reconsideration stage here are changed. During a mandatory reconsideration, the department is supposed to look at the case again. But Owen McCloskey from the Law Centre says capita are being consulted during this process and there is potential for a serious conflict of interest. They are asked by the decision maker to consider new evidence which may suggest medically they are entitled and that's in conflict with their original report. If they determine that the subsequent further evidence shows that the client does have entitlement, then that would effectively be saying their original report wasn't reliable or didn't come to the correct conclusion. We asked the Department for Communities to appear on the programme, but they declined. In a statement, they told us that when a mandatory reconsideration is requested, it's considered by a different decision maker within the department but that they may ask Capita to assess the impact of any new evidence on the company's original assessment. But the main concern for claimants is that what they say during their assessments 
is not always being represented in the final report sent to the department. A serious issue that we feel that we've identified is the audit enough reports and potentially changes being made to the report without clients being made aware of it. It's only if claimants appeal against the decision that they get a chance to see what Capita has told the department about them. Simon is one of those who's not happy with what's been written about him. There were things, as I said, uh, I was like, that, that isn't accurate, that, that didn't happen, or, you know, I didn't actually say that. Uh, and, and a lot of the times it could come down to, you know, he said, she said sort of thing. They made a decision about how far you could walk based on what? You... Based on basically um, the corridor in the assessment centre, which I stopped several times. I, I did not make a oh, straight walk down that corridor and a straight walk back up it. Um, so at no point did they see me, could they have seen me walking 30 to 40 metres. David is also unhappy. He says what actually happened is not reflected in Jill's assessment. Jill can't get up from a seated position. They say they saw her do it. Now that's just blatant lie. That's almost perjury. Uh, they say she refused to stand on one leg. She was asked to and said, I, I'm afraid I can't. I, it just, oh, it, it, it's making me angry. Even though Jill is waiting for a date for her appeal hearing, she hasn't been shown changes that may or may not have been made to her original assessment by Capita. It's a problem the Law Centre says that applies to all cases. We're looking for copies of each version of the report, so before and after it's been edited, and it may have been edited multiple times. We're also looking for access to the actual audit document, so where the auditor has assessed the report, they've identified quality issues and they've made recommendations for change. It's important that we see that actual document. The President of the Pale Tribunal has sent this letter to Spotlight. In it, he says that tribunal members have expressed concern about the auditing practices. He says he's been in regular contact with the department about the issue. And he added if not all information is made available at a tribunal, people can ask for the decision to be set aside and reheard. But after Spotlight put these points to the Department for Communities, they told us that arrangements are now in place to facilitate earlier versions of assessments being made available an arrangement not in place in the rest of the UK. But what of Capita? We asked them to take part in the programme, but they declined. We sent them a series of questions about the people featured in this programme and about their auditing process. They said we didn't provide them with enough personal information to allow them to comment on the individual cases. They said they had a robust auditing process in place to ensure a high quality of assessments and said their staff are healthcare professionals who are trained and empathetic. They added, if anyone has a concern about the process, they can contact Capita directly. Another fundamental question in PIP is when is medical evidence considered and who should provide it? Like all claimants, Simon was asked to give details of his health professionals on his assessment form and assumed Capita would contact these people. It asks you for so much information. All the information the medical professionals who help you. Um, they're the initial thing you put in, so neurologist, doctor, MS nurse, um, occupational therapist, um, to which I later found out they don't actually contact them. Capita told us their official guidance says it's not always necessary to ask for further medical evidence. This is something that the BMA in Northern Ireland has noted. There does seem to be instances where there is no initial medical evidence sought uh, and we would only hear uh, whenever the patient uh, go goes for appeal, so that is the first time the medical evidence is asked for. In the midst of this confusion, some claimants have themselves been going to their GPs to ask for letters confirming their disability. Doctors say this is extra work and some feel they have to pass the cost on to the patient. Dr Stout charges just over £30. Is it morally right that doctors could charge for this? 
I think that is, is something that's very destructive to a doctor-patient relationship. We're ultimately here to, to treat patients and to try and keep them as well as possible. And to be put in, in that sort of, a, uh, of an environment or that sort of a transactional uh, thing is, is very uncomfortable for everybody involved. Raymond Crow is one of the few people in Northern Ireland to have completed his appeal. Following an accident, Raymond suffered facial injuries, which left him with a speech impediment. He was also left blind in one eye, deaf in one ear, and had to have a number of his fingers amputated. He also walks with the aid of a stick. Fed up with people staring at me. I've seen me walking through Belfast, sitting fed up, sitting punched. One boy in particular, after sitting in a restaurant, that's when the woman says, uh, go hard with it. If I look at you, I want to know that is. It was tough. A tough sense of the whole world, all right? I am the way I am. Raymond had lifetime DLA and qualified for a mobility car and a care component. After being attacked and spat out on buses, he says the car was his own safe space and gave him the confidence to leave the house. But that car gave you a little bit of confidence. A lot of them have helped. He also had to go through a face-to-face -face assessment. The first time I went for the assessment, I was talking to her for half an hour, and she says, "Wait, I have to put this in." I says, "What?" Well, so I was talking to her for half an hour. Now I don't understand this perfect. I sold my splits from when I was sort of fourteen years old. Mother, who thought to can that understand me? Uh, on something that used to me. So, so that understand, it took her half an hour to understand me properly, what I was saying. Despite this, in Raymond's assessment, it was noted that he could be understood and that he spoke clearly. It was also noted that he had a functional grip. Like Jill and Simon, Raymond did not score enough points to keep the higher rate that he was previously on under DLA so has had to give back his car. More and more people are taking their case to appeal. There, they can present additional medical evidence. Tribunal reps say they've seen a huge increase in demand for their services. Since the start of September, it has been flat out, sometimes doing two or three day appeals per day. The group say many of the clients they represent have succeeded in having their assessment decision overturned at appeal. No one that we speak to is happy with the assessments. Usually what they say is that either their words were twisted or that some of the things in the assessment were just fabricated. You know? The government don't agree with this interpretation and say that the reason appeals are successful is simply because people provide more information. Quite often the claimant will think, ah, I didn't raise that or I didn't have that and they, can, they have an opportunity to go away and submit additional evidence. Therefore, the decision that was taken before was right on the information provided, but once additional information is provided, a different outcome comes. Shay Ross is representing Raymond at his appeal. Raymond has very visible disabilities, you know. It's someone who, uh, if an assessor were to look at, it's quite obvious there are things he can't do for himself. Raymond's best friend Jimmy says he was taken aback when he saw what was written in the report and found out that Raymond had been given zero points. Totally shocked because when Raymond's out, I and about Raymond had always someone with him uh, because of his, um, uh, his uh, communication difficulties, his grip difficulties. He's got no grip in one of his hands, no grip at all. Uh, Raymond's case was, was baffling to think that he ever had to go to the tribunal. Raymond is still deeply affected by the assessment and feels the whole process has completely belittled his disability. What would you say to them now? <laughs> What would you say to the assessors and people now? <laughs> Come on, man. At appeal, the original decision was overturned and Raymond was awarded standard rate care. But this still wasn't enough to get his car back. Civil servant Paul Gray was commissioned by the government to examine how the new PIP system was working in the rest of the UK. I've recommended that actually, as a default, one should move to uh, assessments actually being recorded uh, so that if there is any dispute 
uh, on either side, there is actually uh, a tape that can be listened to. Any of our advisors can help you through that process. It won't change until there's any change in his circumstances. The Stormont executive knew Pip would be politically toxic. I wanted to try and limit the damage. They pumped extra money into services like this benefits helpline when Pip was introduced. It's handling thousands of calls a month. People on DLA um, who are being reassessed onto PIP um, and are worried about that and worried about the process and how to fill out the forms and worried about the medical assessment, um, they would ring this helpline and we can explain the process and help them through the process. There's also been money provided to recruit advisors to help with the forms. Because they are new forms, it's a new benefit, people are seeking advice on that. So we have extra staff through the Welfare Reform Project in each bureau to cope with that. Aside from this help, money has also been provided to support people financially through the appeal process if they've lost their benefits, something that is not available in the rest of the UK. If you lose your DLA and don't transfer to PIP, you will get um, the, the same amount of DLA paid up until your appeal process. It's to support people and to save them falling off a cliff face if they do lose benefits. Simon was one of those who was helped with the mitigation payments while he appealed his decision. But in the meantime, he had to return his mobility car. I was devastated and my father came up to the dealers and dropped me home and I just felt like I, when, I, when I got dropped home that was me. I was sort of in the isolation status as such, you know. The title is personal independence payment and by taking away my car, they were taking away the, the, my, my ability to have a little bit of independence. You know, that I, I can do things myself and not have to be dependent on others. After Simon returned the car, his mental health began to suffer and he was referred to a counsellor. Thoughts had bounced into my mind. Had, had, me to the point because even when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis I didn't have those kind of thoughts but it was just I ended up just I didn't know I didn't I couldn't see a path as such I didn't know what way life was going to turn out. Capita reviewed Simon's case and stuck to their original decision. The case was then reviewed internally by the Department for Communities. They awarded Simon the two extra points he needed to be able to get another car. He says he finally felt vindicated, but feels he should never have lost it in the first place. Anybody that I spoke to, whether it be on the MS side or, or family, friends, um, any, any <laughs> well, my own GP, I mean, his, his own words were utterly ridiculous that it was taken off me. Martin too felt the whole process was stressful and unnecessary. It had put me into a terrible depression and I actually felt suicidal with it, so I did. I actually have the key for his medicine cabinet, so he can't get into his tablets. It's her worried, you know, it was to that extreme at one point, you know. I could see the distress and anxiety it caused on my father, and the diagnosis itself, there's no cure. So, I mean, why, why was it even necessary for that fellow to come out to assess my father? But I just thought it was a waste of time. Martin was eventually awarded PIP, but as there are no more lifetime awards, he's been told he will have to be reassessed when he is 76 in 10 years. When carrying out the reviews for the government, Paul Gray says he found that the public had little faith in this new system. Well, my conclusion in the second review was uh, uh, that public trust and confidence was a long way short of what you need for people uh, to feel kind of confident uh, that the system is operating fairly and consistently uh, and the sort of things that I was seeing and observing were the high level uh, of disputes uh, uh, around initial decisions uh, and the very high upholding rates uh, particularly for those cases uh, that went to appeal. Supporters of PIP insist they have designed a better benefit which is helping those most in need. Is it hard for you hearing these horror stories of people who've just had such negative experiences going through the system? Well, so, so we don't want anybody to have a negative experience, but the reality. People do. Oh, absolutely, but the reality is that there were all there were horror stories under DLA, and there were far more. The PIP process is recognised to be much more thorough, 
much more uh, able to identify individual challenges. It means we're spending three billion pounds a year more, so more money is going to some of the most vulnerable people in society. But it's not a completed project. With PIP still in its early stages in Northern Ireland, Paul Gray thinks the project should be reviewed before it gets much further. Since my reviews didn't cover Northern Ireland, yes, I think it would be a very good idea uh, for somebody to take a look at that. Spotlight has been told by the Information Commissioner that they've received a number of complaints about Capita and the department. We've obtained figures which show that of those in Northern Ireland who have applied to transfer from DLA to PIP, over 35% have had their benefits disallowed on the basis of their initial assessment. So far, just over a thousand people have completed the full appeals process, of whom well over one in three have been successful. As PIP continues to roll out, universal credit is the next big change in the horizon. Over the next six months, thousands will be affected by changes to their benefits. And it may be that the problems with PIP prove to be just the tip of the iceberg. Details of organisations offering information and support are available at bbc.co.uk slash actionline or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 08000 156 775. Green turtles here in Borneo pay regular visits to a particular patch of coral. This is home to Blennies. They clean the visitors, picking off any parasites they can find. Blue Planet 2 continues Sunday at 8 on BBC. We'll be getting some exclusive performances from his latest album. And having a very revealing chat about my music and my life. That's Sam Smith at the BBC. <laughs> George Lamb travels the country to...